Hello, my name is Dr Julie Blanchard Emerson. I'm a lecturer here at UCA. I've been working here for the last 20 years. I'm currently fashion history and theory lecturer on the fashion journalism course. But today's presentation is all about my own research. So a few years ago now, I did a PhD down at Southampton University. And what I was concentrating on was what I'd noticed uh, in the media had been a rise since about the year 2000, discussions about worries and concerns over young girls, particularly their consuming of fashion, the wearing of certain types of clothes, the wearing of makeup, and all of the things that might happen to those girls if they became too interested in their appearance. And so I decided that this was something I was going to study and that I was going to find out, well, what do young girls actually think about fashion? How do they understand it? Now, I've used a quote from one of my participants in the title of this presentation, Nice Patterned Pants. Now, that's a quote from Leah. And you'll see here on this first slide uh, a photograph that Leah took of her nice patterned pants. Now, they've got the words love printed on them. And for Leah, it was this use of the word printed on these pants that made them perfect to her. She felt like they really summed up her and made her feel like she was really growing up. And that, amongst many things, is what I'm going to talk about in this presentation today. So for this presentation, I will first of all discuss popular concern about childhood becoming commercialised and sexualised. This was the starting point really for my research. People worrying that somehow fashion and things that were out there for sale for children were making childhood uh, tainted in some way rather than being free to explore the countryside, play nice games. Instead, children were more, becoming more concerned with buying stuff. Also that this childhood is becoming sexualized. That childhood would normally be free of any understanding of sexuality. Uh, that dressing for children, um, particularly for girls, is becoming sexy in a way that's inappropriate. Then I want to look at, so that's the popular concern, that's what people believe is happening to childhood. I want to then explore the current discourses of childhood. What do we believe childhood should actually be like then? Uh, what is our understanding of what children should do? Um, what do we think of children, how they should behave and the kinds of things that they should be doing? I'll then go on to signpost key existing areas of research. So who has already done work uh, about things that relate to this subject? Maybe in the fields of fashion or maybe people dealing with uh, stuff around children or perhaps about sexuality. And then once I put up a picture of what other people have already said, and I want to explain, well, what did I go on to do? What's my methodology? What kind of research did I decide to carry out? And really, why did I do it that way? And then after that, I will explain and summarise, well, what did I find out? When I went through this research um, and then... Uh, sort of explored it, uh, wrote about it, what actually did I find out? 
here we have an image. Um, it's a photograph that accompanied an article from the Mail online. And a photograph like this, an image of this type of clothing, appeared across a whole range of newspapers, uh, women's magazines, various concerned people um, showed images like this and were complaining about them. So we've got, what we've got here is an outfit that is aimed at a young girl. The uh, age range for this is something like uh, age eight, I think the label says. Um, using a little miss character, this kind of cute little cartoon character, which comes from the Mr. Men series by uh, Roger Hargreaves. Again, stories that are addressing uh, little kids. Now, this character is used on this brown pants set, as is some sort of cute little pink hearts. And yet, at the same time as these childlike symbols, there is also padding in the bra. And it's this mixture, the, the childlike stuff and then the padding, which is associated with adult women's bras um, for enhanced uh, breast size or for uh, enhancing cleavage. So it, it, that juxtaposition is seen as problematic. And here is the uh, headline that goes with it. High street shops to ban padded bras and sexually suggestive clothes for young girls. So here the writer uh, is suggesting that these clothes aimed at young girls are sexually suggestive. They're being provocative, they're going to make the girl sexually alluring in a way that the writer deems inappropriate for a girl of her age. And it is the padding that's seen as uh, adding this sort of sexual appeal. Um, and so, therefore, this article uh, says, well, you know, lots of people are complaining about this and they're trying to get uh, bras like this uh, from not, you know, they're trying to prevent them from being sold in high street shops. Now, you could say, well, Mail Online, you, Daily Mail, we expect that kind of salacious story. But it certainly wasn't a lone voice, as broadsheets and tabloids alike numerous parenting books and websites such as Mumsnet and also various government reviews focus on the links between 21st century consumer culture and the potential premature sexualization of young girls. So this popular concern, well, as I said, it's not just uh, newspapers like the Daily Mail writing about this. Uh, this is one of the government reviews. This was the uh, most recent review back in 2011, the Bailey Review, uh, called Letting Children Be Children. So saying, well, currently, this commercial culture, this consumer culture, selling these kinds of things to children is not letting children be children, it's, it's making them other than they should be. Uh, one section was devoted to clothing, products and services for children. And we can see here um, uh, a quote from a parent that they called upon to give evidence. Uh, this parent says, designers and providers need to be challenged to consider what they are doing to children. Sex is an easy sell. So this parent is saying sex is something which is being sold use, or used to sell goods to children. And clearly the, the, the verb they're doing to children. So it's, it's not that children are making any of their own choices here. This is about that the clothes will do something to the girls. So the wearing of sexy, fashionable dress is seen as a contributory factor in this sexualizing process. Retail, retailers then are being pressured not to sell certain items. Various recommendations are being made in this document 
Um, but, but as we see, the evidence called on there is from parents. It isn't from the children themselves. And in fact, there's very little research done with young girls to examine whether any of these media concerns are well founded. So the questions I wanted to ask were, how do girls actually understand fashion? How do they make sense of the meanings of fashion on and through their bodies? What part does fashion play in their understanding of personhood, of who they are, and the cat cultural categories of fashion, gender, age, class, and sexuality? What meanings do girls attach to clothing? What things get chosen to be bought? What reasons do they give for them being worn? How does fashion allow girls to think through ideas about the self and about constructing themselves a particular aged, classed, raced person? What might the study of young girls and fashionable clothes tell us about the creation and negotiation of contemporary young feminine identities? So how do girls learn about becoming feminine uh, and in what ways do they do that with their clothes? What we've seen then is that people hold very strong opinions about children and what should happen to children during childhood. Yet what we also know is that childhood is actually socially constructed. And what I mean here is that cultural expectations of childhood for children change depending on historical moment or place. You know, at any one moment, if we look around the world, we can see different ways that children are treated. Different things are expected, different ages at which they're considered to be children, and then to be adults, uh, different types of behaviour expected, different types of learning, um, different types of schooling, all sorts of different ways of treating children. Um, if we give our own, uh, you know, if we give British society as an example, it's only really uh, since the 18th century that, that adults began to think of themselves as different to children. Um, and then they began to create this age-based hierarchy, placing children in subordinate position. In other words, adults began to think at that point that they had the right to not, you know, that they were able to be thinking people, to have knowledge, uh, to be able to have power, and that children should be the ones because they began to think of children as not having knowledge, of not being able to do their own kind of thinking, that they should then do as they're told, uh, need to be looked after, because adults know better. Um, and so they began to see as children as devoid of knowledge and therefore naturally somehow pure and must be protected. And yet, up until 1885, girls could get married at the age of 12, so obviously up to that point, they were considering, uh, oh, it's all right for girls to then be, to be sexually active, so long as it's within marriage. Um, and working class children, you know, worked in heavy manual labour jobs. So clearly ideas about what children are like, what, the, what should they experience during childhood, changes over time. Um, and now in this current world, we've got this idea that children are inherently innocent, that they're unable to understand things, and therefore that they need to be protected from the adult world. But this is something which has only developed uh, within British society over a, you know, a course of time. Even that Bailey review that I was referring to in the last slide recognises that this current uh, discussion of, of childhood innocence is a romantic idealisation. So actually within this current moment of time, there are these contradictory discourses. We kind of think of, um, so this is dis discourse, ways of talking and thinking about something. 
two different ways of thinking about children. Developing out of this, uh, you know, notion that we have now developed of, of this innocence, we're seeing modern life as being full of risks. So we see children now as being faced with a whole bunch of risks that are deeply you know, problematic that we can need to protect them from. And amongst those things, of course, one of them has become we need to protect them from certain fashionable clothes that they're going to put them in, a, in, in this risky position. Um, both in terms of, you know, that they'll become sexual objects. Uh, the Sun here clearly, you know, this is a piece that's written 10 years ago and yet we're still having these discussions, you know, using this word pedo. So saying children are at risk from paedophiles, this is one of the big risks. And that, that, that children wearing padded bikinis will somehow be enticing to these paedophiles. Um, also at risk, uh, particularly boys, from things like video games, violence, uh, tele you know, television violence. This will make uh, boys violent in ways they wouldn't otherwise be. Uh, there's been moral panics about explicit girls' magazines. There's worries about stranger danger. So modern life is seen as riddled with all of these risks that children need to be protected from. And yet, at the same time, Interestingly, we have also developed, uh, and this is sort of one of the things I, I spotted in my research, was that some someone noticed that children are also being discussed as agents and consumers. <clears throat> now, what do I mean by that? A agents is a term from sociology to describe a way in which uh, children might be able to be um, able to make their own decisions, self-determination. Uh, reflect on their own actions, understand and participate in the world. Now we know that they're being increasingly seen in this way because there's charters uh, petitioning for rights of children. They, they're in our legal, uh, you know, pr previously, like, you know, when all the kind of working class children working down mines and all this kind of thing, well, there's all sorts of laws put in place now to protect the rights that ch children are seen as to have uh, citizenship of their own. So they have increased autonomy and they have legal rights as citizens. Uh, this is a UN right, a Rights of the Child poster. So as well as being seen as having kind of some autonomy, legal rights and decision making capacity, they're also seen as consumers, you know, they're now potential, uh, this market which can be um, plugged into, that they, they will be uh, making all sorts of decisions about what they want to have in their lives, what sorts of goods they want to have around them. Um, and, you know, and various phrases are being used now to discuss pester power, for example, uh, their ability to make their wants known um, to those who've got the money, uh, who, you know, who hold the purse strings, as it were. Um, and we know that the, it's the children being addressed as the consumers because thing, if you look at um, adverts that are selling goods uh, aimed at children, the adverts are now no longer addressing the parent, they're normally engaging with the child. Uh, so addressing them and saying, you know, you're the one that wants this, you're the one that needs this in your life. Um, so we've kind of got all these sort of mixed messages about childhood um, and you know this is something which the idea of them as being agents and being able to make their own decisions is something which doesn't enter into the current uh, you know into the popular discourse no one sort of believes there that they have these abilities to make decisions So we've seen a lot of people talking about children and about childhood. But in terms of actual research about children, what, what does already exist? And we've seen a rise of sociology of childhood. So 
writers who are exploring this social construction of childhood that I've just been discussing. And what they argue is that actually when we look at what people believe about childhood, it actually tells us more about adults than it does about children. It tells us about adults' hopes and wishes, the things they really would love that childhood sh would be like and should be like. But there is also more research being done now with children. As people begin to acknowledge that children are agents, that they do have decision-making capacity, that they are able to be thinking beings. So there is this increased research. Um, this Renold piece was uh, in a primary school asking primary school children about sexuality. But in terms of uh, research about fashion, lots of people started researching with children, a few touch upon fashion, but actually if you want to find out more about what fashion might mean, you turn more to the, uh, there's more literature about adults. And there's actually been a growth of empirical work looking at interaction of women and their clothes. So instead of the old dusty, fusty way of uh, theorising about fashion, um, which was to kind of sit somewhere uh, in your office and, and make up, you know, think about, oh, yes, no, I think this is what people are dressing for and this is why uh, women are so interested with fashion. Um, instead, the growth of these writers are take the the approach that you should actually talk to and research with uh, people themselves. So they examine women, ask them about well, what have you got in your wardrobe, they might ask about workwear or what sorts of things enable you to be who you are, how do you feel about these clothes, how do they fit, uh, all those kinds of things. There has also been a rise of uh, focus on materiality and fashion. So academics actually approaching the idea of the physicality of cloth. What might uh, the actual fabric of the clothes, the way it fits and feels on the body, how might that inform our feelings about ourselves of who we are and how we create our identities? And then there's also gradually been this slow growth in though those academics who approach the idea of looking at age, of thinking about how age affects what we wear and how we wear it. So this interest in the importance of age expectations of fashion, that fashion has certain, uh, you know, there's certain expectations about what you wear when you are young, when you are middle aged, when you are old, or different ways in which you're expected to show or cover your body. So far then, we've heard about what people's concerns are about uh, young girls in fashion. We've heard about how people currently think about childhood and expectations about children and girls. And now I hope you've understood a little bit about recent research has been concentrating on and the idea that children themselves are becoming involved in research. So my methodology then, what I decided to look at and how. I researched with white middle class girls aged 8 to 11 years old. And the reason I particularly chose this as a group to uh, research with was because that was the group of girls that all of that discussion, uh, debate, worry, panic had always all been focusing on the problem, the problems that they could foresee with and for this group of girls. Um, and so 
these are the ones that I wanted to find out. Well, yes, so there's all this worry and fear about them and what might happen to them as they become sexualized. But what did this group actually think themselves about what's going on? And I used mixed methods because I wanted to create a multifaceted picture of the interaction between girls and also their personal experiences of the materiality of dress. So the interaction between girls, I wanted to see, you know, f fashion is this thing which is discussed amongst people. So I wanted to see how they interacted and discussed that. I then wanted to see, but also what was their individual experience of the physicality of clothes, of how they dressed their bodies. So in order to try and get that sense of the diversity of experience, I chose these different methods. Uh, the first thing I did was focus groups. So focus groups are where you get a group of people together and you ask them open -end, you know, a few open-ended questions and they debate these questions uh, and the answers amongst themselves. Um, so I found groups through various schools. I got groups of six to nine participants um, who then discussed fashion and clothes with only the occasional prompting for me, from me. Um, it was important. The reason I chose this was because given I was arguing that girls do have agency, that they have some ability to be able to make decisions, think about their lives, reflect on things, I needed to make sure that I wasn't intervening much. I wanted them to literally do the talking themselves. And wow, did they? I mean, <laughs> quite often they would uh, sometimes completely ignore my questions um, or they would go off on such great tangents, they'd just be chatting amongst themselves um, and talking as if I wasn't there. I mean, occasionally, they were a bit kind of, um, sometimes they were really quite patronising. They might turn to me and explain things to me if they thought, you know, as a this elderly researcher, I wouldn't understand what they were talking about with the latest fashion or what was going on. Um, but that was great because that's what I wanted. I wanted it to be them taking charge and them doing the discussing of what was important to them. Um and fashion is this shared phenomenon. It's what's called an intersubjective practice. It's, it's something which is negotiated amongst people. No one person can decide what is going to be fashion. Um, so the groups gave the sense of how fashion is debated. It's negotiated. Um, agreement, there was agreement about what is and uh, what's not in fashion, uh, what actually fashion is, uh, what wearing clothes should be about. Um, this was discussed, it was argued about, it was shouted about. I mean, I, um, I recorded these uh, groups with a video camera and when I came to do the um, transcribing afterwards, sometimes it was like, so, so who, who, says, who says what to whom? About what? I can't, you know, it was incredibly rich data, but you know, so much. Um, and so hard often to hear, but great, because I really got this sense of the debate. Um, and what we got was them sort of starting out with one thing and then discussing it back and forth and coming up with this idea amongst themselves about what uh, certain things meant or were. The next thing I did was then get each of the participants that taken part in these focus groups to do photographs. Um, so I'd got this sense of the group and what these age groups f felt was fashion and stuff around the body, uh, you know, when they debated together. And now I wanted to get the sense of the individual. Um, I wanted to have the sense of the materiality as well. So actual material evidence. So I asked them to take photographs of their favorite clothes or outfits. I wanted to focus on these items of dress as material evidence. Um, 
So once they'd taken these photographs, again, there was some, this gave them the chance to choose what to take it of, um, how to take the photographs, and then I, I got them to think about um, which ones they actually wanted to show to me. And so then I had interviews with each of the participants that had taken the photographs. And then I got um, that through these photographs, they could construct this sense of their identity, identity through thinking about themselves in relation to their clothes, about what kind of person they were and what sort of story they told me about themselves. Now, to give you some you know, all, up till now, it's all been rather uh, sort of text-based. But let's actually have a look at some of the more exciting stuff. Here, then, are some of the photographs that uh, the girls took. Um, and I think what's really interesting here is that this is what happens when you let your research participants take control. You get what they want to get out of this. So for example, um, we get various ways of displaying clothes. You know, some of them here are choosing to display the clothes on the bed. Uh, some, um, oh actually, you know, no, I haven't shown you any of those, but there were, there were some that were taken on the bed, some on other people's beds, you know, other members of the family. We've got bedrooms, floors, um, we had uh, photographs, uh, you know, on the bottom left there, we've got um, hanging on a bedroom door. So uh, Bethany carefully arranged things on these hangers, presented them. Um, she thought that was the best way to show off these uh, pieces of clothing. Oh, and by the way, these names are all... Um, pseudonyms so that uh, to protect you know the, uh, the idea is that they're all um, you know no one will know who they are um, so we've got living yeah we had living room floor sister's bedroom that one um, so the top left is Georgia's own bedroom then top right is her sister's bedroom um, and clearly here this was partly that she wanted to show us the playboy bunny rug um, and, you know, interestingly, so thinking about this sense of, you know, agency of them being able to understand things, uh, not being innocent, having some knowledge. When I said to Georgia, oh, so this, tell me about this photograph. Um, I said, oh, and she told me about the clothing again, but then I said, well, and where is this? That's my sister's bedroom. Um, that's her Playboy bunny rug. I said, ah, okay. Um, so why did you want to take it there? She said, well, I, I like the bunny, um, but it has got a bit of a rude meaning. Um, but that's not why I took the photograph. So clearly there, her mentioning the fact that it's rude meaning you know she com completely understands that the playboy bunny relates to something to do with sexuality um and for her that you know embarrassed by talking about it with me uh just refers to rude but assures me no that's that's not why i took that picture um i took it because i like the bunny which i think is you know really interesting I wrote quite a lot about that um, but then we also get not just where to take the photograph we get the different choices about what to photograph so Georgia for example photographed this same outfit we can see the party like a rock star t-shirt and the Trilby hat uh, in her sister's bedroom then on her own bedroom floor I mean obviously here you know, going back to where they're taken. Well, here she wanted to lay out the whole outfit because she wanted to show it's not just her best outfit, her favourite outfit, is not just one thing. It's about the combination of elements. This perfect top that's about parting, like being like a rock star, this really cool trilby hat, the skinny jeans, the 
high tops, they made the perfect outfit for her. The one in which she said she felt like her um, and that she felt really cool when she went to parties and this was her you know, main party outfit that she'd worn. Now she photographed this same outfit in various different combinations but always the same items of clothes in different orders um, in different places. She took this from all these different angles. Every one of 16 photographs. This is 16 photographs. Clearly that, you know, that's how strongly she felt about this particular outfit. Whereas Alice, photograph bottom right, see that picture in the wardrobe, uh, picture 17 of 27. She took 27 photographs of things in her wardrobe. Uh, so her approach is just, I'm going to photograph every single thing I have. And she went through one by one, you know, so after this lilac-y coloured dress that gets whipped out of the wardrobe, thrown out, the next picture is the white top that's behind it, then that gets pulled out, then the next thing. And then she must have made quite a mess and I bet her mum really appreciated me asking her to take these photographs. Um, but it shows here they have got some agency because they are making these choices about what to take and how to take it. So let's think about then. So I've shown you what they, you know, what I asked them to do, what kind of research I was doing. Now I want to discuss, well, what did I find out? What were my conclusions? So first of all, there were some findings that did respond to popular concern. Let's think about, well, what's the popular concern? That uh, girls are being sort of made to, forced to be into being fashionable, that they feel like they have to keep up with fashion, um, that they're somehow, uh, s girls are being compelled to dress in a way that is, is going to be experienced negatively because they're being forced to feel that they should do this. Now, many girls did want to be fashionable, certainly, and many of them did want to keep up with fashion. But this girly, hyper heterosexualized femininity could also be a source of pleasure and give a sense of agency. So what I mean by that, so there were girls who identified themselves as girly girls. Uh, they were the ones who wore makeup and dressed in fashionable clothes. So they wanted to be fashionable, they wanted to create themselves as girly, and so they actually took great pleasure in this. They, you know, pleasure in being seen as attractive. Um, they got praise for it. For example, uh, Lauren. Lauren was a girly girl. Uh, she said, you know, she liked wearing perfume. She loved jewelry and makeup. Uh, she went to a party. She got dressed up. She wore a new dress. Uh, she'd taken a photograph of. And she said, and Jack went, wow, when he saw her. So there was a real sense of, you know, you're going to get praise. You're going to get praise from boys. You get praise from um, peers. You know, they got a real sense of agency from, uh, you know, purpose from being seen as a fashion expert. So peers would look up to you. You know, the group that Lauren uh, was in, the other girly girls, they discussed how, how brilliant it was when, you know, people looked to them to find out what was fashionable. They were seen as experts. Now, the other thing in the popular debate is the implication that girls unreflectively expose their bodies in ways that the adults think are inappropriate. So, in other words, that girls aren't aware of the problems of why they shouldn't, uh, you know, show their bodies in certain ways and the adults think that they shouldn't show their bodies in these ways but actually 
the line between appropriately girly, in other words, heterosexually attractive, looking pretty, um, and showing too much, you know, going over the top, is actually watched and navigated very carefully, both by girls themselves, um, and also they watched others, uh, discussed others. You know, they talked about the dangers of others showing too much. And they also recognised that actually in certain contexts it was expected that you showed off, um, that adults would expect, for example, at weddings, school discos, parties. Adults expected you to dress up, to show off, to, sh to wear a, a little dress that showed some legs or to wear some little heels. In other words, they were already aware of cultural expectations of femininity. To be sexy, but not too sexy. You see, you know, this is one of the problems. They're growing up in a world in which young women get praise from looking sexy. So, uh, and then when adults confirm that by saying, oh, you look very pretty today. Um, you, you, what a lovely dress. You really dressed up well. You know, they're getting confirmation that actually dressing up is a good thing. Now, one of the things, obviously, that all these discussions have in common is they assume that fashion is something which is dictated by the retailers. The people selling the clothes are the ones that are saying what is fashion um, and that girls are, you know, going to kind of blindly follow that. But actually, what was fashionable is negotiated between the girls. You know, that I said I get the sense that in this focus group so there was lots of discussion about what was in, what was not. I like pirate boots. Mm, no, they've gone out, or you know, they don't suit me. I really don't think you should wear pirate boots. Mm. You know, so it was discussed back and forth. And in fact, some rejections were outrightly just rejected. No, we don't like um, we don't like this particular fashion. And, you know, fashion shouldn't just be understood as some kind of mass conforming. Girls talked a lot about individuality, that you could use clothes. Yes, you might want to follow fashion in some way, but you also want to express your individuality, that you wanted to be your own person, that you might clothes, take certain clothes and make them your own in some way. Um, that there's a way of expressing yourself through your clothes. And the other thing, uh, sort of final thing which relates to this sort of popular concern, is that it's seen that there's somehow an unthinking acceptance that girly is the only way to be, that dressing up is the only form of being a girl, of <clears throat> wearing mini skirts and stuff, is the only way to dress. Um, and that they accept that as somehow being kind of a natural way to be feminine. But amongst the girls that I researched with, there was a recognition of positions such as girly and its kind of opposite number, tomboy, um, as identity constructions. They knew that you weren't naturally one thing or the other, and that even if you performed a girly girl identity, <clears throat> that didn't necessarily mean that somehow naturally you liked pink, for example, or that if you were becoming a tomboy, it didn't necessarily mean that you liked blue and or never wore pink, or you know there was lots of discussion about uh, being a tomboy but having long hair. Um, so they could see that. These things weren't natural, they're not set in stone. Just because you perform one identity doesn't prevent you from liking things that are seen as being part of another identity. Also, there was acknowledgement that you could be a bit girly or sometimes girly. These weren't things that were just set in stone. Uh, you might play with them a little bit or 
do them sometimes, but not necessarily all the time. As the last slide showed, there are things about the ways in which girls want to consume fashion that do cor correspond with some of the worries and concerns. However, it also showed that it's a lot more complicated than that, that it's not a straightforward blind following and that there is some questioning going on, there is some sense of individuality and in this slide I want to talk about the ways in which I want to further complicate that and suggest all sorts of different ways in which clothes are being used by girls. So clothes allow girls to construct multiple identities. So unlike you know, in the popular concern, you, the assumption seems to be that once girls start being interested in fashion and wearing certain types of clothes, that they're sort of stuck in that position. They'll become sexualized, and all sorts of other problems might follow. However, it isn't just a simple case of girls constructing one identity. In fact, they create all kinds of different identities. So for example, well, I have an example here to show you. Um, this is a girl, was a girl called Emma, and she uh, was very articulate in talking about herself and her clothes. In this uh, image, it's a photograph of one of her favorite outfits. So we've got a, a, a sort of um, sloppy top that's got stay cool on it. Uh, we've got a pair of trousers. Now these trousers, Emma describes as her raggedy trousers. So they're raggedy. Um, she told me all about the fact that they've got rips at the knee, that they're all kind of worn out. Uh, They've been worn so much that they've kind of got ripped and a bit torn. Now, this is, is still a, a favourite outfit. It's not posh, it's not polished, uh, it's not girly. Instead, it's something which is torn, ripped, that she can get dirty in. And in fact, she described herself as she was talking through this outfit, she said, I'm quite outdoorsy really. So she thinks of herself as being a particular kind of person, an outdoorsy person, and these clothes allow her to be that person. She also told me that one of the reasons she loves this outfit is because she doesn't like dresses. And yet, she also described special occasions. Special occasions where she might wear a dress. And here is another of her favourite outfits. So she took a photograph of a dress, the kind of dress that she says she normally doesn't like. This dress has got, uh, it's, it's a white bridesmaid's dress. It's got strips of sort of satiny cloth coming down from the Empire Line uh, waistband. It's got, um, a sort of chiffon -y net layer over the top. It's the bodice has got sequins on it. There's a big bow on that empire line um, seam. Then we've got a little be furry bolero jacket. So this is a really kind of uh, dressing up outfit for special occasions. Um, so she wore this to a particular wedding and she talked a lot about this. Uh, what she said about this particular outfit at first is, well, I don't like dresses, but I will want, wear one to a special occasion. I won't like try to get my way out of wearing one. When I think I need to wear one, I'll wear one. In other words, the need to wear, if it's a particular social occasion, that there's uh, certain expectations from family, from parents, uh, if the kind of 
whole sort of context of when and where she's going to wear it, the expectation is that you wear a dress, then she will wear one. So the creation of one type of identity does not pre prevent the construction of a different identity. It all depends on the demands of the context. And the girls, you know, lots of the girls had the examples like this, in which they moved back and forth through various identities. So even if they produce a kind of girly, uh, heterosexually attractive, um, pretty, pretty look for one occasion, doesn't mean that they're stuck like that. Doesn't mean that's the only way of being for them, that they can become a different type of person. And, you know, they will wear a certain clothes according to occasion and expectations. Clothes also were related to embodied practices. Now, what I mean by that is things that they did with their bodies. So, for example, uh, related to things like there were certain types of clothes that you wear for playing in, um, and they allowed you to move around. It didn't matter if they got dirty. Uh, there'd be sort of things that you can do handstands and they're not going to show you knickers. You could go bike riding in them. All those sorts of, you could do all kinds of different things wearing play clothes. Clothes also had a relationship to things like dancing, to dog walking, to splashing around in water. And what those types of clothes did was allow the girls to think through themselves as being different types of people. Uh, to explore what it means to be a dog walker what it means to be a dancer, a bike rider, that you can be all those different types of person. Um, and it's the clothes that allow you to think through being that person. Clothes also materialised memories of practices and relationships. <clears throat> so for example, not only did they allow them to think through being a type of person, but they allowed them to think through memories of doing those things. So talking about certain types of clothes and wearing certain types of clothes reminded them of times in which they have played, when they were dancing with friends, when they went out walking the dog. And the clothes helped them to remember those occasions um, and to, to be able to talk and tell you all sorts of details about those times um, through looking at the clothes, thinking about what they were like to wear when they were doing those things. The fact that they can memorise, uh, they're also material reminders of memories of family, occasions, friends. You might keep, you know, they kept certain things because they reminded them of their grandma or of uh, a family member's wedding or party. Uh, they also kept things because, well, they're, you know, my friend gave that to me. And, you know, even if there were things that they no longer wore, uh, or in some occasional influences, maybe some, sometimes it was something that had got broken, but they would keep it because it reminded them of the person that gave it to them. Uh, they were also a way of exploring those relationships. So we you know, are a group of friends who all, we wear shorts like these. Um, and what does it mean to be a friend? What does it mean to be a friend who dresses in similar ways? Well, because we all feel the same way about certain things. But also dis displaying that friendship too, that you might, you know, display... Uh, the fact that we are a group of friends because we all wear similar kinds of uh, clothes. Um, we've all got, you know, we all keep a, a, this particular friendship bracelet because we want to show people that we are friends together. And also they could display family bonds too. Uh, so, for example, there were, uh, you know, they had um, taken photographs of things that they had that, you know, a certain family member gave, gave them and oh, I love wearing those shoes 
they were important because, well, mum gave them to me, uh, they're my little high heels, she knew that I would love them, um, and that when they wore those shoes then it, it reminded them and it told others that, you know, my mum, you know, loves me so much and she knows what I'm like, she knows that I like these sort of sparkly shoes, um, or one person had a bag that her uncle had bought her back from uh, a foreign country. So it, you know, she would wear that bag because it remind, you know, it helped display to the other members of the family that he, you know, this this uncle uh, is loving him. He remembers her when she goes away, and she re remembers him through wearing this bag. Now I'm moving on to findings that I uh, discovered in my research that I analysed that were really the crux of what my PhD was all about, that I was finding, uh, you know, this kind of new stuff about the relationship between ageing and clothes. So these are findings that add to our understanding of experiences of ageing. I mean, if you pause a moment, how do you know you are ageing? You know, if you didn't look at the the calendar, if you just sort of thought about yourself and your body, is it different to how it was yesterday? Is it different to how it was the day before that? How different would it be tomorrow? Well, the answer is you know, it won't be significantly different. You won't feel any older, and yet your body is aging. It's aging all the time. So how do we actually experience that? How do we know that it's definitely happening to us? Well, I mean, obviously, there are sometimes some dramatic things that happen that suddenly make us realise that, yes, we are aging. I mean, I remember getting... To university, uh, second year, moved into a house, putting up stuff on the walls, a mirror, and you know, just about to go out, I look in the mirror and see old oh, white hair. You know, this is a, a sudden moment of realization of, oh, I really am aging. This process is going on, whether I want to, whether I want it to or not, whether I'm normally aware of it or not. It must be happening because this white hair is proof of that. And it actually, it hadn't appeared out of nowhere. Presumably it had been there for a while. Um, but I only became aware of it then. And then suddenly I'm, I'm realising that, you know, time has been passing. Um, so my research here is, is going to show us about this, that experiences of our clothes enable us to understand this passing of time and of the ageing process. So talking about what I found out from the girls then, I've kind of grouped these together. So this is going to be all about um, the present in relationship to the past. So understanding who you are now in this present moment is often done, uh, certainly in terms of the research I did, was often understood in relationship to who they had been before, what their body had been like. So in relation to clothing, this happened in a number of different ways, this thinking about who you are in relation to the past. So they, for example, distance themselves from babyish clothes. You know, oh, I no longer wear those silly, uh, that silly cowboy outfit. I no longer wear the those uh, dungarees with the duck on the front. Um, so distinct themselves, remembering that they used to wear babyish clothes. They talked uh, about all sorts of babyish outfits, but that they no longer wore stuff like that. No, who I am now is not that little girl who wore these babyish clothes. So we get this uh, next appearance of 
uh, Leah's nice patterned pants that I uh, began with. Here we've got um, pants that have the word love written on them. That for her was significant. Significant because she was allowed to have these and she talked about them as being her sort of grown up pants. They're not babyish in particular, you know, and she talked about her friends still wearing babyish things, but she enjoyed the fact that these helped her to age up away from those babyish clothes, that they were significantly different for her to feel like she wasn't that little girl from the past. She was this sort of new grown-up girl right now. Um, as well as this, things like this pattern being important, what I also discovered was that the fit and feel of clothes in particular was incredibly important. So for example, baggy clothes that hung loose on the body were both gendered and aged, according to the girls. So they're associated with masculinity. Baggy clothes are things that boys wear, and they're also things that they, they themselves used to wear. So baggy as a fit was related to the past, and you want to distance yourself from that. So you now wear skinny jeans, because skinny jeans are not the baggy jeans that you'd have worn when you were this babyish child. Now the current fit of clothes that had become too tight also enabled them to then think about this process of growing up. So as, you know, talking about this fit, okay, so we've got the difference between baggy and tighter fitting or skinny, but also things that become too tight then make you realise, oh, I am actually growing up. Um, so the fit and feel of clothes served as reminders of their ever-growing body, that their bodies were constantly changing. Yes, it might not be noticeable necessarily on a daily basis, but, you know, there were certain pieces of clothing, you know, they just worn and then they put them on and then, you know, realising, oh, that's got a bit too tight now. So who they are now is constantly in relation to, oh, this thing has become too tight. That was me, but uh, I'm moving on from that now. So these, they're regular reminders of this ever-growing body. The physical of sensation of clothes means that they're frequently reminded of the fact that they're growing out um, and therefore of their age and their progression through time. So if we think of our you know, wardrobe of clothes as containing all the elements through which we can make our identities, who we are now is contained within that set of clothing. Girls were constantly having to reassess their identity as garments became too small. So you had this perfect thing, but well, it's gonna, you know, it's now too small. So who am I? Who am I now then if I can't wear these perfect things? So in fact, they experience uh, the growing out of clothes both as a, you know, a fear of losing identity as well as this way of exploring who they currently were. So this fear, because you know, one minute you've had the perfect fit, um, perfect fit on the body, but also a perfect fit between the inner and outer you. Um, so for example, this outfit that Georgia had talked so much about that kept coming, you know, being photographed and being uh, used as an example of her favourite. So this, it had been a perfect fit, not just on her body, it had been a perfect fit between the inner her and the outer her. You know, they were one and the same. She was this outfit, this outfit was her. But by the time she showed me this photograph, it had already become too small. She was already growing out of it. She said the jeans were getting a bit too tight, they were a bit too short, um, that the, the uh, Shoes were also becoming too tight. So if it's, you know, one minute's been the perfect thing, it's been you, and it felt like 
the you that you felt you were and the you that you felt in these clothes was absolutely perfect. But now it's it's not possible to wear it. It can't be you. So it led to this constant reassessment of who they are in the moment. Who is, you know, who was Georgia at that point then when I talked to her? If, you know, this could no long, if this image could no longer be her. The next element of this understanding of the experience of ageing. So we've seen that clothes in the research uh, seem to help girls to think, to distance themselves from the past. What, you know, I'm no longer wearing these babyish things, particularly in terms of I'm no longer wearing the things that are baggy. But things that become tight remind them, oh, yes, I am growing. My body is constantly changing. Um, and now I've got to remake myself anew. I've got to find the perfect fit of the, the perfect outfit that encapsulates me and who I am. But in this section, I'm just now going to look at participants understanding themselves in the present in relation to the future. So as well as looking to the past and being aware that the present is constantly becoming the past, they also were aware of what was going to happen in the future, thinking about who they were going to be. Now, some wanted to age up uh, and look grown up. For example, those patterned pants, they weren't just about distancing, for Leah, they're not just about distinct, distancing herself from who she's been, but also about wanting to try and look grown up, to move into the future, to, you know, the whole point of, you know, one of the things here is uh, around how do girls get from being preteen to being teen? You know, there's this process of growing and development which is changing their bodies and who they are. And, you know, so they look to the to clothing to help them think about grow, this growing process. And clothes acted actually as transitional objects to future identities. They allowed them to experiment with future identities, symbolically allowing the movement from one identity state to another, from preteen to teen. For example, here we've got an outfit from uh, Lucy's photographs. She showed me this uh, set, which is her crop top for next year, and they're my pants. Um, it was the crop top that was particularly significant and it kept on coming up in her uh, interview. Um, so she talked about this crop top and what she called it was her pretend crop top. And what she meant was, she said she's only allowed to wear it in bed now. But she also talked about how she would wear it next year when she needed one. In other words, she's thinking about oh, crop top. This is something I will wear as I get older because I will need it then. Because dress enabled both the projection into the future and simultaneously a thinking through of the present. So she can imagine herself growing up because she think, could think of herself um, you know, as being a bigger girl, uh, having grown up more, needing a crop top and by the need she's talking about having breasts that this crop top will be something that she'll need um, you know she she needs really to have breasts to fill the crop top and she can project into the future of imagining what it will be like to have those boobs to do uh, need this top to cover those boobs but simultaneously they allowed her to then think through well so I'm, the, I'm a person at the moment, I'm, I'm a girl at the moment who doesn't have breasts that need this kind of crop top. So, you know, she's both, these clothes are enabling this, projecting into the future, imagining who you're going to be, but then, and thinking about what your body will be like, but then reminding you of the bodily lack that you have now.
my suggestion then is that potentially uh, my research has come up with uh, new theoretical tools, new ways of being able to um, find out about our ageing process and how we experience that. So I would argue dress and clothing and fashion could be this really important way of finding out more about how we experience the passing of time. So our experiences of clothes enable us to understand the passing of time and the ageing process. The relationship between our bodies, clothes and temporality is a dynamic one. So temporality meaning time So our, uh, and kind of our understanding of, of time and our awareness of where we are in time. So our understanding of time is through the interrelationship between the past, the present and the future. And maybe we experience that via our clothes maybe one of the ways in which we might understand who we are is kind of thinking through clothes we wore in the past, how they fitted, you know, think about things like um, it's the weekdays after you've had a big weekend, you've eaten lots and drunk lots and, you know, oof, yeah, you know, your, your waistband's got a bit tighter. You know, that allows you to think, about this passing of time, that the weekend was all of this kind of stuff, that's in the past, and it's actually, you know, had this bodily change, uh, so that in the present, you can think through yourself as being, whew, the person who possibly needs to eat a little less this week, um, and in the future, oh, you know, I'll have uh, run another sort of 10k every day, and, uh, I'll have worked out loads of my weights and actually the waistband of these uh, trousers will be looser, but um, they'll be tight around the thighs where I've now got bulging muscles. You know, there's all sorts of ways in which perhaps talking to people, researching with people about clothes will help us to understand how we feel that passing of time, how we understand our relationship between our bodies, our clothes, time, ageing. Maybe we all come to know ourselves located in time and on our life course through our embodied material relationship with dress. Maybe there's a sense in which even those who don't think of themselves as being fashionable or interested in, in fashion or in clothing, you know, it's not until we probe, it's not until we do the research and talk to people that we might find out more about actually Every, you know, everyone has to wear clothes uh, within our society um, and everyone ages, everyone goes through time, everyone has a, a life course um, and that, that will change, you know, the, the, the relationship between that body and clothes will change over time. And maybe if we were to do more exploring around this and ask more questions about this, we could understand a bit more about how we understand time, how we understand age, uh, that dress, um, clothing and fashion are all exciting tools to help us understand who we are. Um, and obviously for a PhD, uh, you read hundreds and hundreds of books and articles, but um, I put a few references in to this presentation and the, they link to this uh, bibliography and there's sort of a few of the key texts that I thought uh, people might find interesting in relation to some of the things that I have talked about today. Now, obviously, I couldn't tell you everything. Um, some of the things I've had to sort of leave hanging. You know, what else did Georgia say about sexuality in relation to Playboy Bunny? Um, what other uh, great insights did Emma have about herself and her relationship to dress? I don't know. There are all sorts of loose ends that I've left hanging there. 
if you want to find out more, if you have any questions about any of the things that I uh, have said today, then please do email me. Uh, I'd love to hear from you, love to hear what you thought, if you have any comments, um, any questions at all, please do email me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.